Hi, my name is uh, Vahanda Wodian. I'm a physics experimentalist for 30 years. And in fact, I have already uploaded 36 theories on YouTube. It was great success and people emailed me. They loved some ideas and we exchanged some views and then that was amazing. So I'd like to thank YouTube for this fantastic opportunity for us. It's like a huge university. We can upload our videos, they can upload their videos, and then we watch and then we learn a lot. That is great. And in fact, I compared uh, YouTube to Synapse, which is a junction in a human's brain and is connecting billions of billions of neurons together. All the biological functions are carried through those. And that is exactly what the YouTube does because it's a comprehensive network and I love it since they started to change the world and then I appreciate that. You can have any idea and then upload it on YouTube and then people watch it and then they learn a lot and thanks a lot and in fact this is the way the YouTube is promoting science and imagine it's like a free university if the YouTube was not there how could I upload my videos and then uh, you have to pay a lot for advertisement and some other things but the YouTube is free and imagine everyone is available to everyone it doesn't matter who you are and how much you know about the science or what it is fantastic opportunity for us and thanks a lot and in fact today like I said I uploaded 36 theories in this last six months but now today I don't have a theory these are facts I mean why facts because uh, these are small like one minute or some of them less so I decided not to have one video for each one of them because it doesn't make sense so I had to combine them all together and then 35 of them in three parts and today is the three of three in fact and then uh, these are all laws of physics and why I decided to do that? Because, you know, all my life, when I see something, that was my nature. That was my passion. I would pick up something and then I would analyze. If I didn't know, I had to go at that time. There was no Google, there was no Yahoo, nothing. All my source was the book and the physics teacher and the science teachers. But nowadays, you guys are so lucky. You have internet, you have uh, everything at your disposal. So you should be thanking God that how easy it is to learn these things. So I decided to publish those things because these are little small things. I um, mean, little small things that, you know, you do that in your everyday life, but you don't realize these are laws of physics. And in fact, I came up with a fantastic idea for the title, How to Learn Laws of Physics in the Streets. You might ask, well, how could we do that? Can we? Yes. Whenever you are at the street, you can learn something. Everybody is performing laws of physics. So, my idol, when I was like 10 years old, I remember I used to uh, do like electric motors and then sell them. That's the way I would make my money and then go buy ice cream and some other things. You know, I was not asking money from my dad or mom. That is the way I made my own money. And then I asked my brother about uh, who invented this electric motor DC. He said, Michael Faraday, I said, who is this man? He says, from England, and so and so. And, you know, I couldn't even read that at that time. But, you know, I heard that he was a fantastic person. He was so good. With no formal education, he made history. And then the good thing was he was in a bookshop, and then he was hired in a bookshop. And imagine he was so poor, his dad was so poor, sometimes he was going to bed hungry. I mean, that man was genius. I mean, how could he go all the way through? But you know what? He had something in his mind. When the French guy hired him in like a bookshop, and then they gave him a room so he could sleep there, and Michael Faraday was in a gold mine. And imagine some other people, my dear, well, we don't have to do, we go on the sleep. But you know, he was not sleeping. He was avid reader. 
And I heard one time that, you know, he would read and read and read, and finally he would pass out. So that finally he made it. I mean, imagine the loss of induction. We cannot even survive. In AC or DC, we cannot even survive. So anyway, all these things for today is my observations for, uh, I would say, maybe for 30 years. And in fact, I started when I was six years old, and I don't remember, I have a fantastic memory. And then uh, I didn't go to kindergarten, and then I was getting ready for the first class, and then I don't know, like Sir Isaac Newton, I love apple. And then um, my mom said, you know, uh, you give, go get your apple and then go play if you want. I said, no, I don't want to eat. So what you want to do is said, give me a string. And my mom said, why you don't need a string? I said, yeah, I want to do something. So it, it was just a curiosity. So I had a string like one meter and then I suspended that apple. It was rotating. I had no idea what was clockwise, what was counterclockwise, and so and so and so and so. I didn't know. But like I said, that was like I was a baby. And then that happened to me that, you know, why this is rotating? I didn't pay attention. It took 30 years, and then I was 28 years old, I came to the United States, and then we had a, a friend, he was a physicist, you know, he would take me to Caltech, and then uh, UCLA and the other places, we would learn a lot, and then one time we came up this rotation, it's called Earth's Differential Forces. Anything you suspend in the Northern Hemisphere, it doesn't matter as long as it's not a wire, as long as it can cause torque on it, like a thread or you know, a small rope or something like that, it's going to go clockwise, but it is inversely proportional to the mass. Anyway, and then after that, I didn't pay attention again. I'm, well, I, and then I said, yeah, it does rotate. And finally, by year 2000, I started my own theories. I had to go back. It says, Vahan, this is reverse engineering. I'm glad you still remember that apple when you were six years old, it was rotating, but you had no idea why. And then you were 30 years old, 28 years old, and then the apple was still rotating, but why? Louis Pasteur was my favorite scientist, uh, microbiologist. And uh, he was so genius, and then he came up with a spontaneous the uh, generation and some other things. He solved so many problems for the human and sit work. And then I had to follow his footsteps. I went and buy some silk worms and then take care of them, feeding them. But you know, his life was so amazing for me. One time the wife came and said, yeah, one of your daughters died. And then there was another one died. Well, of course, there was no negligence. At that time, the medicine was not up to date. And then it was different. But his dedication for the human beings was so much good than his own family. And imagine, finally, he solved the problem. And that is the way I learned from uh, Louis Pasteur that, you know, you have to be dedicated, you have to work hard if you want to make it. Anyway, and then he has a famous quote, which is golden. It is always in my mind. He says, chance only favors prepared mind. And then this was like 28 years ago, I read something about the Mr. Fleming who discovered the penicillin. And imagine, he was absolutely right for Mr. Fleming, because Mr. Fleming was a fantastic doctor in England, and then one time he was on vacation outside London, and then he heard that, you know, a little boy, a girl was, uh, you know, crying, and the tears fell in that special, you know, thing I call it, you know, Petri, uh, Plato, whatever, and the bacteria did not, I mean, do anything over there, but you know, his mind was prepared. That's exactly what Louis Pasteur said. If we see the same thing, Dr. Fleming was a doctor, and then he found out, and the penicillin saved human's life. 
Then I said, yeah, I have to follow, see what happened. And then when I went back, six years old, when I went back, 28 years old, I said, well, that's it. These are differential forces. So sometimes you can go back in history. Well, of course, this was, I mean, coincidence for me. But what I mean, that is the way I learned. This is a little bit controversial and uh, most of the time I can see people say, well, failure is not an option. I was seven years old and then I started reading a little bit and so and so and uh, Pele, the best player in the world, was 11 years older than me. He was 18 years old and they call him Black Pearl, he was fantastic, his agility was so amazing, uh, and how poor he was, God knows, and then he had an amazing life anyway. But I heard about Pele, and then I told my brother, go get, uh, you know, like a, a newspaper, and read it for me. He said, he's the best player, and it's the Brazil. And imagine, World Cup and things like that, he was genius, the way he was playing, nobody could stop him. And then I realized most of the time Brazil is not a winner. Sometimes they lose to Germany, sometimes Brazil is losing to England and the other teams. I said, you know what? Failure is good. What if Brazil always wins the soccer games? What will happen? They will not try again. Well, when you fail on something, you don't give up. What you do, you go back, you analyze everything, and then you bring the facts, and then see, and then you take everything into the consideration. Where did I fail? And then you solve the problem. And then, it, you know, I was so observant, and then I realized one time Brazil was playing exactly the same players. I knew their names and everything else. And the other team was exactly the same. And one time Brazil lost 2-1, two to one, and the next time they won 2-0. Two to zero. I said, you know, it doesn't make sense. At the same team, same players, so what happened? Failure is good for you. And at that time, I had no idea about Albert Einstein, but when I started my own Theories like uh, when I was in, uh, it was uh, 20, uh, in the, it was year 2000, and then I realized Albert Einstein was total failure. They call it gymnasium or their high school, he was total failure. Even in college, he got zero. He was total failure. But he was so stubborn and smart, he would go home and study. And it just happened to be that Albert Einstein was copying everything amazing i mean well i'm not going to call that plagiarism because that is a bad word i hate that but you know that is the way science always promotes you get something albert einstein followed the other guys and the other scientists neil Bohr's, and then here comes werner heisenberg you know they followed each other that's the way the science was promoted and i knew that the albert einstein was total failure and then he made it Sometimes I watch uh, old movies and then especially Discovery Channel and then uh, animals are my favorite, how smart they are because I love animals, it doesn't matter, even insects you may not believe, I love insects as well. And then uh, I remember I read a book that the will is a great invention and in fact it is. And imagine that simple machine changed our life. I said, Rohan, you have to analyze how this was discovered. And then I was watching a documentary. I saw a river, huge river, like, you know, Mississippi River or, you know, the other. And then I saw huge logs and they were getting, you know, bumpy places. They turn a little bit. And logs are, some of them are like 100, 120 kilograms. I said, maybe this is way people love this because they're turning and that's why the wheel was invented. And sometimes they get the logs, 
they put it so they're going to get dry so they can use it they make like a boat and some other things and you know by accident maybe they just put their feet those the uh, logs and then it went forward somehow it was rolled I said yeah that is another thing maybe that's why they discovered if they cut that a little bit it's going to be the wheel well of course the wheel started with the uh, I mean stones anyway like when the Egypts were around and then my second thought was people were always observing the you know sky and then the most important thing they would see they couldn't watch the sun anyway the most important thing they could see the not the planets I would say moon was always there changing phases I said okay see moon is round how about if we make this round and that worked because that is the way their will is and it's been God knows 4,000 years and that time was I think was old Iraq or where uh, that was invented and imagine when I watched the uh, pyramid I realized some documentaries the most important part to build the pyramids was ramps of course workers they tortured them anyway and the ropes and wheels and imagine without the wheel we couldn't do anything this part is so funny I remember when I was in uh, Northrop one of our professors, uh, he had a great sense of humor. He would ask questions and then we had blank face. He said, guys, this is a pitfall question. I said, well, sir, what do you mean by pitfall question? He says, you fall in a pit, but you can't get out. And then now I have a pitfall questions for you. So this is called the Vahanda Vudyan relativity question is greenhouse good or bad I mean automatically when we think about the greenhouse I mean we might rush us to second planet which is like unbelievable 800 degrees or 600 degrees there is no way anything can survive there because of greenhouse effect but greenhouse effect is a little good for us for our planet and then the second question is which is so controversial are bacteria good or bad if I go to elementary schools the chances are 90% they will say it's bad I said no but if I go to colleges and universities or even especially chemistry you know classes they said yeah bacteria is good so it depends on which bacteria I mean, the nature is the way it is. It's a huge chemical lab. Our stomach, you know, for the animals and things like that. Everything is decomposed. Everything is broken down. And that's why the bacteria does. Without the bacteria nitrifications, and well, I don't want to go all in details because I studied natural science. And then I don't want to go in that, it's everything, life cycle, everything has to do with the bacteria. So, this is my favorite question. Are asteroids or meteorites and comets good or bad? Probably the younger generation say, well, it's bad. No, on the contrary, asteroids are good. I remember I saw one in Denver, Colorado, and then that was like, uh, uh, like almost like four million years old, and then it was iron and some other things. And uh, when I watched the universe, it's been, I would say, many years. I don't remember exactly. Every day I have to watch the universe, and then I was always wondering. Well, I think there was a hydrogen and oxygen. That's why we have the water. But the scientists say, oh, no, 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 that's not the one. Everything came from the comets. Everything came from different planets. And now I believe that is true. So that is what happened. 
and imagine how could we get iridium which is not even on earth it came from different places father and son they were scientists their name was Alvarez and then they realized there was an iridium where the peninsula I mean uh, um, Yucatan peninsula was and then they realized that was great moment in the history of mankind it came from different planets so what I mean asteroids are good it depends on I mean the asteroid who destroyed 55 million years ago that was not good anyway but overall this is one so practically all these things when I said the answer was yes and this was my favorite one fermentation food food such as cheese or you know the ability of bacteria to degrade the variety of organic compounds and imagine I love beer I'm a beer drinker and then uh, I used to make my own beer but it was not as good anyway and uh, when I studied Louis Pasteur life and he was genius on the fermentation and things like that I said what will happen if we don't have a fermentation what will happen if the animals die and there is no decomposition we will destroy our planet and decomposition is helping and then everything is back to the soil and then of course some bones left anyway and then that's the way it is Because I studied natural science and then uh, all my life I have always, I mean, uh, I have always, you know, scrutinized things, I have always, you know, uh, analyzed things. And you know, sometimes I compare, uh, you know, two birds that are free fall and then they're fighting, one of them is eagle and the other one is the smaller, but it takes sometimes five minutes to the eagle can catch the little one and then kill kill her but overall their agility is amazing and I was comparing with airplanes I said there is no way that the human can do airplane like that it is impossible the nature has provided something airfoil for the birds and then I mean why the humans were had no idea and then we had to wait for the Wright brothers and then they found out this airfoil and then the airplane was invented and uh, what I mean this is so amazing that the humans we cannot beat the nature I remember one time our professor in uh, LA said uh, something amazing his name was Dr. Howard Gerish he said uh, the, any nation who can measure to the smallest portion they can have a better technology well at that time I remember it was like a nanosecond, picosecond, femtosecond and now I realize he was right and you know if you can go to the measurement, the smallest measurement you can solve so many problems This is amazing invention and in fact, uh, like I said a few minutes ago, pyramid uh, and I like to thank uh, some people from England because their scientists are unique. Always all these movies I see they're from England, you know, even the animals and so on. So they scrutinize and they never give up and they go all the way and find out that the pyramid and the main component you know to do that was millions of millions of people and God knows how many dies we have no idea but it was a ramp I mean how could you get your piano to the second floor if you don't have a ramp so you need a forklift what if there's no forklift and then you go get a huge ramp then you extend it long enough so you can pull you can push your piano to the second floor so that is the ramp that is the way the ramp works. Ramp is amazing. It will give you the mechanical advantage. But in physics, there's always something. Nothing is free in physics. You gain something, 
but you lose something else. You lose something, but you gain something else. So if you have a ramp, small ramp, you won't be able to push your piano to the second floor or third floor if the ramp is too big, so you need less Newton force so you can push it. This one is my favorite and uh, you know, wherever I'm going to uh, out of town, I do laws of physics. I think I'm going to have to show you this. And this is uh, why, why our vision changes our perception by Vahan Davudian, physics experimentalist, email vahandavudian at aol.com. I have to read the whole thing because this is amazing phenomenon and most of the time you might ignore this. Why we are driving and passing trees, the trees further appears to move slowly and closest move faster. The farthest something is from your field of vision, the angle and or the angle let me see where it was. So it says, yeah, uh, far away, the object you are looking. I tried uh, with uh, my car with 60 miles per hour. And well, I have to explain this because uh, I, I can't read like this. When I was driving, uh, I had to go to work. I used to work in Denver, I mean, Golden, Colorado, and that was beautiful nature. And then, like I said, we had trees, and then it was fall. I remember one time I looked up my window, I realized those trees close to the road, I can pass so fast. A little bit further, slower, a little bit further, slower, and slower. One, I remember the fifth row was almost like I would say uh, one kilometers away from me and then I realized I cannot pass that but I can pass the same tree, the same row like in a few seconds but that one might take more than 10 seconds and then I said I better check this with the airplane and then whenever I'm traveling I have to sit by the window and then I just get a, you know, like a, I would say a small, uh, like a patch of uh, not uh, because I don't want to check with the clouds because they move. I get, you know, like a rock or something. When I look down and then my uh, vision is almost like I would say, not 100, 90 degree, a little bit more, and then I can see I pass that rock immediately. And then when I get further, like five kilometers, 10 kilometers, it will take me two, three minutes. And I knew there is a laws of physics here. And then I had to do this so you can see how important this phenomenon is. Let me put this back if you see how important this phenomenon is. See? I'm sitting here, the last row, and this is southwest, and you see my angle here? You see? It's right there. There is a small, you know, rock or something over here. I pass by immediately. You see my vision? See how big the angle is over here? But when I see this one, it's a little bit more. Well, when I see this far away mountain, it might take a few minutes. And then I said, this is not convincing me. What can I do? And then I said, I have to do something else. I had to find a road like 100 kilometers. And then that was uh, not, I mean, curving. It was almost like a straight road. I said, I have to get my car and drive like uh, 100 kilometers or 60 miles. And then I realized moon was over here and this is my car was driving. And then I said, wow, that is true. Why I'm not passing moon? Because of the distance, because of my the angle. You see how big my angle is. And then I realized 
That is so important. And next time if you go and you drive, it will take you more than one and a half hour to pass the moon. And the moon is following you. And I remember I was joking with my friends. I said, well, now let's go to 100 miles. It doesn't matter. Moon was following me. I went like 20 miles. Moon was following me. So imagine how important it is. When things are a little bit far away, your perception changes. And uh, this is amazing. Uh, This is amazing. Uh, this is the experiment I did it in Castillo Sea. Okay. In fact, Caspian Sea is the biggest lake. It's like almost like an ocean in Iran. I mean, an ocean and Iran. And uh, I knew because I studied a lot of physics books. I knew that you know, every time five meters you drop in a horizon. You have to go eight kilometers, and uh, that was amazing. I had no idea how could I do that. I said I better put it in test, and then I can bet with my friend, and even you know, get like free movies or something like that. So, if you travel exactly eight miles, I mean eight kilometers, which is five miles, you drop exactly five meters. If it's four meters over here, you can still see the ocean. I mean, the best way you can see Earth is round, I mean, it's globe, you have to go in a lake or huge oceans where the rivers you won't be. Ocean is the best. So I knew that the eight meters, you have to drop five meters so you don't see anymore. And then, uh, north of Iran, we had like beaches and so on, so it just happened that the lifeguard was there and then I don't know why I asked him one time, how high is your, uh, how high you sit? And the lifeguard said, it's five meters. I said, okay, now the mystery is solved. What I can do, I can bet with my friend and then I can get a free movie or something like that. So, we rented a real old boat, it was like almost uh, going, because it's going by not, but I was old and then banged up a boat and then I told my friend, you blindfold me. And by the time we pass by and then we don't see this tower anymore and it just uh, disappears, you let me know, I can tell you exactly what the speed was. They said, no way. And they had no idea what I meant by that. So we started like that, I was blindfolded, and then we came all the way, and then my friend said, hey, hey, get up, get up. Open my blindfold. Now we don't see it anymore. So I realized, I said, how long did it take? He said, 50. He said, 50 minutes. So what I did, I decided, and in fact, Alan, you uh, I mean, came up with this formula which was amazing. So speed is always equal to distance divided by time. So I divided the eight kilometers by the time. Uh, it was uh, 1.6. I came up with 50 minutes. And they said, how did you know that? And then I felt bad. I said, you know guys, I cheated because I have to tell you guys, not only you, I did not win the bet, you guys did. But uh, my main idea here is, I mean, if you know that, you know, you can have eight kilometers, it drops five meters, you know, I mean, if you're traveling, that is a good information for you. Most of the time, Most of the time, you can learn laws of physics at birthday party. And then you get like uh, balloons and then you blow on it and you let them go and that is the fun part. And if you notice, it's going backward and that comprises so many things. That is showing Sir Isaac Newton's third law action reaction. 
and then that is also the way the rocket works. I mean, you don't have to be genius to see how they work, what are these, you know, boosters, what is this rocker, what is this, you know, launch pad or anything. But what I mean, you can learn all these laws of physics in everywhere, but you have to be able to pay attention, you have to be able to scrutinize it. See, this is going up, so it's an action here, and the reaction, this goes, and then by the time they pass the gravity, they just detach and then this continues and see how there is no way that from now on you always remember the action reaction is the birthday party always you go to a birthday party you use those things so this is the way you learn I remember Euclid was amazing person Probably one of the best, I mean, mathematicians at the, in the history, Euclid was an amazing person. And uh, I don't know why uh, we studied geometry, trigonometry, and so many other things. And uh, one thing was not, uh, I mean, was confusing for me. At that time, I had no idea space is bent, uh, time is bent, and so on, so I didn't know about uh, uh, Albert Einstein anyway. And then when I learned, I said, yeah, Mr. Euclid, what you said about the parallel lines, they never meet, it's different, they might meet. Because it depends on how far you go. If you have like 2 meters, 5 meters, 6 meters, 100 meters, they don't meet. What if one lane is, not, I'm not saying you can't even measure that, nanometer, picometer, crooked, in the long run, it's going to be, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be parallel. And then I remember one time I heard about the computer genius. Mathematically, he proved that, uh, you know, two lanes will meet in infinity. And, well, of course, I mean, nobody is here to do that, like, 200, 300, 500, or 1,000 kilometers, anyway. And this part is about... Uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Hooke's Law. I love Mr. Hooke because he was an amazing scientist and he was a you know, contemporary with uh, Sir Isaac Newton and uh, they were both good, good scientists. And imagine, I had to compare you know, the earth to the springs, not million, not billion, quintillion. Every time you press on earth, it's pressing back to you. See, let me show you here if I have something. I have to press it like this. See? If you press on it, press it back. And amazing, it's proportional. Do you see the amount of distortion? And this is called restoring force. Distortion, restoring force. And imagine, it's just easy to see what is 10, 10 newton? This is exactly 1,000 gram or 1 kilogram. So I had to get this, and then I realized when I push this like this, see, it stops right there. See how easy it is? This is 10, this is 10, 10 newton. And then, I said, how could I do that on my bathroom scale? You may not believe. I can, I can push on this bathroom scale like 100 kilograms or 1,000 Newton force. And sometimes I was thinking, how could a single person push that like Two tons, three tons car. Well, of course, if they're level, if it's not uphill or downhill or anyway. See, look, if I push this, regular push, it goes to 30 kilograms. But if I'm standing over here and pushing with my hand, it goes to 100 kilograms. So imagine by your hand, is exactly like a spring. You can push the spring. Well, of course, these are not 100% accurate. 
these are not used for trades or anything because these are not using uh, sensitive things it's just using like all these the springs so this is important so see you can push here and then you say wow well, i'm pushing 20 40 50 kilograms and imagine that is how easy it is i mean of course the other way is you can even have extension let me show you here see this one has advantage so not only let me open this up you can see see this extension springs is amazing it's called a state of equilibrium it's almost 5.5 inches but now it's extended like exactly 50% extended and then you can tell this is one kilogram and now if I have another one it will be extended more it will be extended more the hook said Mr. Hook said the amount of restoration see this is a restoration see restoration it says the amount of restoration depends on the amount of distortion so when I push this I'm distorting but this important fact for the Hooke's law you have to make sure not to exceed that uh, you know distortion if you push this so hard it's not going to go back see now if I get this like this see it's going to state of equilibrium because I'm not using 10 kilograms if I use 10 kilograms it's not going to work This is important concepts in physics, and uh, I don't uh, I don't remember having mentioned this. His name was Christian Doppler. He was genius, Austrian physicist. One time he was in a restaurant having you know steak or something, and then uh, there was a, a open truck came in like you know those uh, you know special trucks. It's open. You can sit and then watch the scenery and so on and so and then people were playing trumpet in Austria and I think it was Vienna and then Mr. Christian Doppler was having lunch and then he realized something special happened when they went by and then the sound was different when they were coming close sound was different and that is called Doppler effect so it's exactly like you know I have one over here I can show you so this is like Doppler effect let me show you see see extension is proportional to the distortion so if I have a car over here imagine this part is extended the other part is contracted so Christian I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, he realized and he came up with the idea that, you know, always when the siren passed by, I mean, when that, uh, I mean, ambulance or whatever is passing by, the sound is different. And nowadays, we use that in astronomy and physics, we can go and then discover different stars and so on and so, but now it changed to red shift and the blue shift. And my idea was, if the sound travels, well, of course, we know it's mechanical, but the light, they say always is constant. Well, I'm not saying it is not, it is constant, but it depends on how far the light travels. If it's traveling between the planets, it's so, if, if it's traveling from here to the moon, it's okay. What if it's traveling beyond sun and the Mars and so on and so, and then the red shift come in equation. They are stretched, so the thing are stretched. That always this was my idea for the speeches in universities and sciences. Always I said, guys, remember always, you know, amount of you know compression is directly proportional to amount of you know, uh, I mean compression or extension, like kinetic energy. When you drop something, you are losing kinetic energy 
but you know, at the, no, 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 sorry, you're, you're dropping something, you're uh, losing gravitational potential energy, but at the same time, kinetic energy increases. And then it doesn't matter, it is perfectly tuned. It doesn't matter where you measure that, the amount of kinetic energy is proportional to the amount of gravitational force energy. Because this is the way the universe works. In fact, uh, this one is uh, so good that sometimes I can see it's a little bit confusing for some students. And then I decided to do this experiment. This is the most important laws of this is called conservation of angular momentum. I remember when, one time I was at Regis University and they were asking about this. They said, you know what, you don't have to go far. And next time you go home, you turn on your fan, ceiling fan, and then you realize that is fixed to your ceiling. If you have that and then suspend it, it's going to go the other way. They said, why? It says, because there's a conservation of angular momentum. I said, this is the best way, so this is 12 volts, and then I have the blade. This is exactly like suspended helicopter. And imagine, when I check this, plus minus, this is going to go clockwise. If I hold this, see, let me show you. See, it's going clockwise. But, if I let this go, because there is no action reaction, it is going to go free, and it's going to be the other way. See, this is the best way. So, next time you see the conservation of angular momentum, you can say, huh, this is the way Vahan did, and that was so easy to remember. Look, see? Now, watch closely what happens. Did you see? Look. See, the reason why it went like that, because it's a conservation of angular momentum. You have to make sure that, you know, you hold this, because otherwise... And imagine, uh, next time you see a helicopter, and then you have to ask yourself, why? There is a, you know, blade. In fact, uh, when I was in Bell Helicopter International, I worked at like a warehouse supervisor and then we used to go and then uh, chat with those engineers and so and so. It was fun. And the uh, Bell helicopter happened to be from United States, uh, was one of the best when Shaw was in Iran. And I remember it was like a billion dollar uh, thing. And then even nowadays, uh, they use the same thing in Iran, 214 Jet Ranger, Chinook and the other things. So, and uh, like I said, uh, it's just easy to remember. So, conservation of angular momentum. When you see ice skater, is the same way. You can go back all the way in, I mean, cosmos, you know, like, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 light years long, you know, nebula. It's always going, you know, when it comes closer, closer, it's gaining more momentum, more momentum, same like it. Sometimes you uh, get your uh, thing and then you shave yourself or sometimes you have like computer and things like that. But I want you to pay attention what happened. Why is always it's a ferromagnetic thing like this? It's mostly the round and then you see this is, I'm sorry, this is 12 volts. Why is there? So these are ferromagnetic. And imagine, these are suppressing the noise and then getting the unwanted electromagnetic things and things like that. And then next time you go and then your computer board is bad, they're not going to give you in a plastic bag. 
There's a special box and then it's protected electrically. And imagine, uh, I mean, Michael Faraday did this like uh, 1831, and it's called Faraday Cage. It's the same thing. They are in a computer shop, they're not going to give you in a plastic bag. It's a special plastic bag. Even if you touch that, it's not going to get damaged. So imagine all these things are important, but like I said, I want you to pay attention and then if you don't pay attention, if you don't scrutinize or if you don't uh, do anything like that, you are not going to learn. And the last part, which is the highlight of my, uh, you know, speech for today is uh, Mr. Elon Musk, uh, which is my favorite man. And uh, he's a great person, and uh, in fact, uh, it might not be my lifetime, but I'm predicting sooner or later, uh, Mr. Elon Musk is going to have like 100% electric cars. And then I had to get the same gearbox so I could show you guys exactly what I mean by that. In fact, uh, this is from a motorcycle, and then uh, what happened is exactly the same ratio. But Mr. Elon Musk is an amazing person. I mean, uh, they could use planetary gears like this, because let me show you, 99% of the cars in the market, they're planetary gears. You can see this is called sun gear, this is called planetary gears, and the ratio on this one is 1 to 3, there's another one comes on top of this, so 3 times 3 is 8, 9, but overall, by experiment, you know, I know that, you know, planetary uh, gears are not as good as ordinary gears. Well, of course, if you pay attention here, we call this helical. Helical means they're not spur gear. The old days it was a straight, but, you know, they, they realize helical gears are much better, so... Let imagine this is the induction motor, see? That is the induction motor, and then it is reduced here three times, another 3.5 times here, and this is going to the wheels. And there is no way, now I'm rotating this, I can't stop this because, see? The torque is getting so good here. Well, of course, I mean, Tesla S is not exactly like this, but it's exactly the same concept, exactly the same ratio. Well, of course, these are not real good gears, but they work anyway in a motorcycle. So you can tell, if I go this way, one, one rotation, the other one goes 10 rotations, but I have to go 10 rotations to get this. And in fact, you know, I love Tesla because, I mean, I used to have Mercedes-Benz, brand new, new class, 6,000 maximum. But the Tesla can go 2.28 seconds, 100 kilometers. And imagine 18,000 RPM versus 6,000. I never go 6,000. I mean, that induction we owe it to Mr. Nikola Tesla anyway. And I'm glad Mr. Elon Musk is following that and then he's a great success, he's a good man, I like him. So, and imagine this is a simple gearbox for the Tesla, it doesn't matter S or the other one, because they are using ordinary gearboxes, it's a, you know, two reduction, and they can have more, but they don't need. The reason why this is the key, 18,000 RPM, and there's no spark, nothing, and they last forever. So I have seen uh, so many millionaires in a history, but unfortunately, none of them are 
as good as Mr. Bill Gates or you know Mr. Elon Musk, how many people you can say millionaires that they get like hundred thousand dollar check to the space programs like Elon Musk, uh, and uh, his mind is working always. He's so young. I mean, he's so genius, and uh, I appreciate that uh, what he does. God knows how many people work in the factory, and you know. Uh, the whole world respect him because of the car they make is aluminum and that is so good, the performance is good. But uh, you know, one thing is uh, bothering me that you know, the lithium is an amazing element, but unfortunately it's expensive. I was thinking, I'm not even sure because I need some engineers to work with me, I said instead of doing three phases, we don't even need an inverter if we can have a huge DC motors, not one, not two, three DC motors, it doesn't matter if they do it with a commutator or whatever. So they can run the AC motors and then produce three phase AC, so we don't have, to, well of course there is a point here. That car is not going to be 31 kilograms, it's going to be like 100, 120 kilograms, but still it's not bad. So if they can produce that, if they can generate that alternating current three phase, we can eliminate the battery. But, you know, it's just a wild thought. I mean, if you can have DC motors and then they can, uh, with the, you know, mechanical, I mean, with the, yeah, they can rotate the other one and then make like three phase so we can eliminate the battery. Well of course we do need a battery for the other ones for the DC but imagine those DC motors can generate AC and then well single phase is not gonna help because three phase they are causing EMF they call it electromagnetic force and it's going round and round and round and I'm hoping you know one day I have to be able to put this in test but unfortunately in my science lab it's too small I can't I need some help I need some university labs and so and so and so and so but overall I'd like to appreciate you guys did support me and then some people called me and my main objective here is you know to promote the science I'm not here to teach or anything like I said all these observations will solve and next time you put a cup of coffee in your microwave oven oh remember what Vahan said it is a water in it water is a polar so that's why the cup is not as hot as the tea or coffee so these are small facts well, of course, I have more. I have like 30 more and hopefully I'm hoping next week I will publish those. But, uh, but like I said, uh, this is the way I'd like to thank everyone and uh, I'm hoping, you know, Mr. Elon Musk will continue this thing and then he promotes the science, he promotes the technology and uh, in the history of America, I don't remember after Mr. Westinghouse which was a good person also, like Elon Musk. He was working with uh, Nikola Tesla. After George Westinghouse, Mr. Elon Musk made a history. Thanks a lot, Mr. Musk. And uh, you know, all the students, if you have any question, ask me. I'm a great digger. And don't worry, even if I don't have the answer, I will dig it out for you. I will research it. Uh, because all my life, is not for sleeping or thing. All my life is in Barnes and Nobel and the physics books and things like that and the libraries because I'm just investigating and when I see something I remember and then I had to go back like I said reverse engineering and then I put it to work. So I'm hoping those 30 more will be published later but you know your your support is so good for me, this is the way, you know, I'll be encouraged and then uh, I can have more theories for you guys. And like I said, even though there were simple facts, but they revealed a lot of physics because these are our ordinary lives. So, thanks a lot anyway. And uh, I just uh, wanted to tell you guys that, you know, I appreciate you watch it. 
Unfortunately, I talked a lot and then uh, because I couldn't uh, do anything, I had to get all these theories. So this is going to be three parts and this one is going to be three of three. And hopefully you can watch it at vahandavudyan at al.com and let me know what your thoughts are and what is your logical analysis for these things. And if you have any corrections, I'll be happy to get those, you know, be happy to put them to work. And then I'm not proud of myself, but you know, I know always people make mistakes. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it.